current session 2.1 titled Protectionism or Free Trade. This session will be moderated by Mr. Anthony Kim from the Heritage Foundation. Mr. Kim, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the uh, afternoon session of Asam Plenum. Uh, the topic of this session is very exciting. It's really the linchpin and connector of the theme of this year's Asan Plenum. We're going to talk about trade issues. The big debate we are facing, we are having nowadays is, are we really having free trade trade or protectionist trade? So that is the theme of our conversation of the, uh, this afternoon. So I really hope to be this is a conversation, not debate, because again, because of the nature of the subject, it can be well, very much, you know, emotion charged debate, but we hope that this can be very much conversation. Obviously, within 75 minutes, we cannot resolve all the differences. A perspective from Washington, Seoul, Tokyo, Beijing, 75 minutes are not enough. <laughs> but we will try, so we'll try to cover as many key topics of your interest as much as we can. And before we start, uh, we collectively, we thank Asan Policy for, uh, 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 Institute for Policy Studies for putting together this timely session. I'm not going to introduce our speakers. They have well-established credentials. So I'll just briefly mention their name and affiliation to begin our conversation once again. Uh, Mr. Goodman, now Council on Foreign Relations, welcome. Ambassador Kim, a former uh, member of National Assembly and trade negotiator who actually made the U.S.-Korea FTA happen in the first stage. And Clark Packard from Cato Institute in Washington, D.C. And Professor Suzuki from University of Tokyo. And then last but not least, uh, Professor Ja from the uh, Peking University. So as you can see, our speakers this afternoon, very much diverse in terms of perspective. This is really fitting into this afternoon's session, Asia, prosperity and security, the key pillar of that prosperity and security is really trade dimension. So I'm going to invite our speakers to share their initial perspective, perspective from Washington, perspective from Beijing. We'll start five minute or so opening statement, and then we'll build up our conversation as we go. So I'd like to start with uh, Mr. Goodman. Why don't you share with us what you see from Washington? Thanks to Asan uh, Institute for inviting me here. I'm very honored to be um, here uh, again. Um, so this is a very timely conversation because in about five or six hours from now, uh, the Biden White House is going to announce a major uh, package of um, tariff increases on uh, a range of uh, imported goods from uh, China, uh, everything from steel to semiconductors to electric vehicles. Um, and batteries and other other um, other products, and pretty pretty dramatic, I think, um, as a um, just <laughs> in terms of the actual um, increases um, of tariff rates across those products, um, and um, you know I think that is really a sign of the times uh, that we're in. I was going to start by saying we've never really had free trade and we've always had a little protectionism. But I do think the trend lines are pretty clear at the moment that uh, certainly we are um, headed in a direction of, of protecting our um, perceived um, uh, uh, challenges to our national security and our economic security as, as is um, being defined uh, right now in Washington. And you know, I, I guess I just want to make three basic points about that. First, I do think that uh, Risks in the world have increased, um, and you know whether those are pandemic-related risks, or climate change, or um, China-related risks, or supply chain disruptions. There are a lot of new risks in the world, and you know when risks increase in your life, uh, you buy more insurance, or if it's you know crime in your neighborhood, you put stronger locks or alarms on your your house, um, and so in other words, you're willing to pay a price, a cost, uh, to uh, to protect yourself. And I think if you look at through that lens uh, and, and you agree that risks have increased, uh, then I think it's reasonable for 
governments, uh, the U.S. government in this case uh, tomorrow, but, uh, but I, I think every government has been doing some version of, of this kind of risk mitigation or intervention in the markets to, uh, to mitigate risk. Um, this is a uh, not unreasonable uh, a thing to be uh, doing. And so I think that's really the first point that, you know, I think there is a reason why uh, governments, including the U.S. government, are doing more to intervene in the markets um, than they may have done, um, you know, in the past. Uh, but uh, the second point is that uh, this obviously comes with a cost, as I said, and that cost is um, not yet very well defined, and unlike when you're you decide to buy a, a better insurance policy and you're given actuarial calculations of, of what your risks are and how much you, you should pay to protect yourself against those risks, there hasn't really been an honest reckoning for uh, the, the costs and assessment of all this. And there clearly are going to be uh, costs from, um, from the downstream effects of some of these uh, protectionist measures. Um, I was just in Wisconsin a couple weeks ago as part of a listening tour we're doing for a new project we're doing at the Council on Foreign Relations called Real Econ, is its nickname, but it's uh, reimagining American economic leadership. And we're starting by listening. And we went to a canned goods um, uh, factory, a processing factory in northern Wisconsin, central, north central Wisconsin, and, um, and learned that the tin plate steel that's used in the cans that, that are used to, to package these, um, these uh, cut beans uh, were subject to the Trump tariffs and uh, led to a raise of uh, general prices for these cans because even the American producers raised their price when the, when the imported steel was, was tariffed. And that has now made these canned beans, in this case, less competitive uh, than beans that are being imported directly from places like Thailand where the steel is and uh, the whole product is not subject to tariffs. So there are downstream implications sort of everywhere to this, and that's something I think we need a more um, honest accounting of the costs of some of these policies, and we, we, we haven't really fully um, seen that yet. So that's something I think we all can contribute to, um, including all the great think tanks that are represented here, I think should play some role in that. The final point is that, that I'd make about this is that even if you accept that some risk mitigation and some intervention is, is appropriate um, through um, whether it's tariffs or export controls or industrial policies, uh, I, I think that can't be the whole story. It cannot be the whole story. We have to also, uh, we also, also have to offer something affirmative and positive in the economic realm if we're going to deal with really all these risks, but, but certainly the China-related ones. I think the United States has to have an affirmative agenda offering its goods and services, but also its preferred rules and norms. And in many cases, we're not doing that. We don't really have a, an affirmative trade policy at the moment. Um, we haven't had one for a couple of administrations. Um, and I think we, it would be in our interest to be, um, to be back doing that again. Uh, and it's not just trade. It's also we need to offer other things, um, uh, foreign assistance and um, infrastructure investments and so forth. Um, so there's a sort of missing piece to the economic security. I think it's part of economic security. Um, there's a lot of work for Korea and the U.S. to do in, on all these issues, and, and I'm happy to talk more about that in the second round. Thank you, Matthew. Thanks for that big picture parameters, key practical parameters. I think there, if there were any clear, undeniable climate change, I think this is a climate change we're facing. I'm talking about global trading climate change. It has been definitely uh, tilted towards a lot more protectionist, a lot more very different scenery, basically. I think that's the challenge all of us we are facing. Perhaps, uh, who knows, it could be worse as we go. So from that setting, Professor uh, Ja, from Beijing's perspective, uh, we, you and I, we had a short conversation during the lunch, but let's try to make it a bit more like a conversation or so. I'll invite you to share your perspective, Professor. Okay. Um, Thank you. I would think the biggest risk for China today is not the United States or decoupling by the United States and its allies. Uh, the biggest risk for China is a failure to manage the dynamics of divesting 
by Ch companies in China to other, uh, say, low-cost economies. If you look at how what the United States, Japan, and to a certain degree South Korea went through, they did not manage to pick up that uh, uh, technologies or industries that dealt with the consequence of divesting. And China is going through that. We have the big interland, I the uh, inland provinces. We have the central provinces, and also along with this, you have a demand for entitlement, even though we don't go through a voting system, but the dynamics of governance uh, is the same. Uh, very quickly, the tariffs to come on the EVs and whatnot, uh, um, it's not the U.S. being friendly or anti-China, right? Uh, how this is handled, whether it's countervailing as allowed by WTO, or it's national security that is beyond discussion, we have structural issues. And those structural issues don't just apply to the China-U.S. context, it applies to all other contexts. Now, do Chinese see risks? Yes. Uh, in many ways, many people will say, well, <laughs> made in China 2025 was a precursor to, you know, U.S. and others taking the same approach, subsidies. But it, it, you put it in the Chinese scheme of things, and particularly here in Korea, right, the 25, 20 plus years we went through in terms of total economic blockade uh, resulting from the Chinese participation in the war on the Korean Peninsula. So you always had that sense of saying, let's not be a little bit careful about embracing globalization or in accepting vertical integration of industries and technologies because you never know when these sanctions or blockade would return. And uh, that's why actually, if you still remember, I mentioned cables in the morning. Uh, so risk is real. It's not just some talk, it's not influence. We came from risks and probably you have a, a sense of saying, let's work harder, let's be in that harder. You, you have to be self-protective and prevail over these forces. The last uh, point is that uh, we, had, we do need to talk about some bottom lines of this competition or uh, whatever. It's not just blanket talk about trade. Issues involving food, issues involving medicine, issues involving especially put that can be put under the big basket of biotech, no, m a lot more than pandemic. Because at the end of the day, regardless of preferences for political systems, worries about the future, war, even after war, a war, you still need to live. That's human. That's your own society. So I think that's probably uh, what uh, it's meaningful for such conversations to go for. You, 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 there has to be some off-limit topics, uh, issue areas in terms of the de-risking. I'm not, again, the Chinese do de-risk, and we have a long history of de-risking from the rest of the world. Let me put it that way. Thank you. Thank you for that very candid comments, opening remarks. Uh, I appreciate you deepening and expanding our conversation horizon, starting from China's ongoing internal challenges. And if I may, a bit of shortcomings too, as well as other key items going beyond chips, you know, right, exactly. food and medicine and all that. So I deeply appreciate you expanding our conversational horizon here. So with that, actually, that's a very good setting to for me to invite Ambassador Kim. Now we are from Washington to Beijing and coming to Korea here. So Ambassador Kim, you made this most advanced bilateral FTA in 21st century. That's a U.S.-Korea cross FTA, and that was the last bilateral FTA, real meaning FTA, Washington has pursued and made happen. Three times surgery went on, Bush, Obama, and Trump. So from your perspective, 
What do you see? What are you concerned about? Well, thank you, Anthony, for that uh, very kind introduction about me. And uh, I think uh, Asan Institute, this is uh, a very wonderful symposium at a very opportune time when you li really feel a little of a dialogue among nations. So this is a, a wonderful occasion, you know, to exchange views with uh, neighboring countries. Well, the topic of this session, protectionism or free trade, uh, give me a kind of uh, notion to my mind whether we have a kind of optional decisions to take one or the other, or we are really uh, kind of choice at before our hand you know, to choose. Yes, we were at a crossroad, whether to choose a kind of uphill road for further liberalization and further opening of the market, or the other road, uh, much easier downhill. But you know, I have to say that crossroad was far behind us. We have already taken a road, and everybody knows what road we are now taking. You know? So let me tell you uh, two proof in my mind. Number one, just some time ago, well, let us re recall about what happened with the Doha Development Agenda, you know, what they call DDA. Well, that negotiation had really difficult times even to make a very little, some baby steps forward. Never. <laughs> Due to the lack of a leadership first, then kind of a fatigues from the nations around the world from, I mean, fatigue from market opening. So these two combined, you know, uh, it was very difficult to make any steps forward. That's the first proof you know, why we have to take the other road so far and where we are now today. The second proof is it is very hard, you know, in any news line, global line, to find uh, any uh, leader of a nation or nations uh, who calls for further liberalization or deeper opening of a market these days. Nob nobody, nobody calls for that. You know, it is very hard. Maybe seven or eight years ago, there was leaders and there here and there you know, who claimed for we need the further opening of the market, but not anymore. So. Uh, as my first presentation at this session, I feel you know, quite fairly enough that globalization is over. And globalization is now replaced by something else, which is, in my mind, mercantile, my country first. There is a kind of uh, you know, catchphrase in everywhere now <laughs> in the world. All right, having said that, I think we have to look at why then. You know, well, many people usually think about the trade tension between U.S. and China as the foremost uh, reason why the globalization is now staggering. Well, that may be right. But let me take another you know, more fundamental and more undercurrent you know, reason in my mind is that uh, That is the emotion of a common people you know, living in many countries around the world who felt that they, are, they were left behind you know, during the course of globalization. And their jobs, their products were challenged by foreign products, by foreign investment. Well, they were common peoples like uh, you know, petty farmers or mom and pop you know, store owners or jobless or you know, low-paid blue-collar workers, they were very vociferous you know, with the tool of communications available for them, which is, I mean SNS. And wha wha what matters really is these people, in number of them, is not really you know, negligible. In some countries, they outnumber the, the number of people with a satisfaction. Then, you know, suppose any political leader by any means, cannot disregard outnumbering you know, people claim for 
the change of rule of the game. Uh, so I, I think uh, any leader to go on a further opening of the market or to really ride on the wave of globalization for their own growth, that would be a heroic work you know, in that kind of uh, political circumstances. So well, that kind of uh, you know, uh, popular democracy combined with the lack of leadership uh, and together with the trade tension between US and China, well, of course, you know, if, if you need my answer on the topic of uh, this session, uh, we have already gone into a kind of a mercantile protectionism <laughs> these days. Mm -hmm. So this is my first presentation, mm -hmm. and I would be glad to say anything, you know, if you give me the second chance to speak up. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. That very much straightforward uh, assessment from your perspective, the practitioner of, uh, you know, free trade theory, and then you are actually, you know, the denegotiator for South Korea. So when you mention the uh, demise of a chapter of a globalization, because globalization is a process, it's not always like one, one thing, right? So we had a different versions and stages of globalization. You said your observation, the demise of globalization, the current one at least, if not abrupt pause, that actually remind me the relevance of the WTO, the World Trade Organization. We're gonna come back to that because obviously WTO has a still relevance in our conversation, and I'm sure that the, uh, you know, Professor Ja, Clark, and Matthew, you probably have a few things to say about mm -hmm. the, the future of WTO, if not the, uh, the current fate. So we're gonna come back to that. But now I'm gonna switch gear, and we're gonna go to Tokyo this time, and Professor Suzuki, the three big Trump trade policies, in my view, US, Canada, Mexico, NAFTA revision, and then kind of redoing the uh, US-Korea FTA. But uh, you know, his final years, not like a full-scale FTA, but mini FTA or you know, limited version of trade agreements with, with Japan. So that was probably one of the, you know, the, not one of the, the three of the Trump trade policies. And now we are getting into potential kind of new chapter, potentially with a Trump once again. What do you see? What makes you anxious when you see today's global environment from Tokyo's perspective? Right. Um, thank you, Anthony, and uh, thank you very much for Asan Institute for inviting me. And this conversation is already fascinating enough, but I think this is an extremely important uh, uh, theme to discuss for the uh, major, uh, major objective of this uh, conference on the future of Asia, prosperity, and security. So. Um, I, I'll just offer my um, Tokyo perspective on the uh, current globalization and how um, we see that the question of the risks in, uh, in, in the international trade. So first of all, I, I think the Japan has been uh, de-risking before the word de-risking became as fashionable word. Uh, Japan has established the Economic Security Promotion Act in 2022 and uh, we established the um, uh, Minister for Economic Security, and that is basically trying to identify where we are between the free trade and the protectionist. So yes, I agree with Ambassador Kim that uh, we are no longer in, the, it's, a, it's a demise of the globalization, but at the same time, we are not yet at the protectionist, or we shall not go to the protectionist. So we need to find somewhere in between. And that is basically to find out where the small yard ends and where the rest of the world is remained to be free trade. So the small yard high fence in Japanese understanding is that we need to make the yards as small as possible, which is related to the security issues, but also very strategic uh, problem. And this strategic understanding came from the experience in 2010 when China has uh, stopped ex exporting the rare earth mineral to Japan, which is the major ingredient for the building up the hybrid car, which is the major uh, export uh, items from Japan. And the purpose of, the, uh, of China is to release the, uh, release the uh, a captain of the fishing boat, which collided with the Japanese Coast Guard. So basically, this kind of the economic coercion is already been in, uh, in the picture of Japan. 
And we, the, the lessons we learned from the 2010 incident is that if we are depending heavily on the one country, in this case China, about 90% of the items, the rare earth we imported 90%, and that is giving us a vulnerability. So I think the um, in previous sessions there was discussion about the interdependence equals vulnerability, but not all the interdependence is uh, uh, vulnerability. It's the excessive, inter excessive de dependence on the particular item which uh, is uh, critical for your econ economy to one country is the vulnerability. So we need to I isolate the other general issues of the interdependence or the, you know, the, uh, 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 the dependence on the other country. We can, I, I think the very useful word in this case is the French shoring. The, as long as we can import the items in the multiple sources of the friends who can trust or trustworthy uh, 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 partners, then that's not going to be the subject of the de-risking. De-risking is, is when you have the item which is excessively depending on one country. And that is the, that is the concept we have. So therefore, in uh, Economic Security Promotion Act of 2022, Japan has identified the 11 items, now it expanded to 14 items, that are the major concern. And these are the items that need to be diversified, the supply chain, we need to do the uh, R&D for, uh, for the alternative, uh, uh, you know, o o o create an alternative um, sources for the, for the supply, etc. Also, uh, one of which is the semiconductor, and therefore Japan has heavily invested in the semiconductor issues, uh, semiconductor industry uh, to invite the TSMC factory in Kumamoto, Kyushu, and also creating the company called the Rapidus. And finally, I think this, the future of Asia, or future of the free trade, should be the free trade with resilience. And I think this resilience means that, uh, uh, in Anthony's question, um, it's the how to deal with the current uh, hostile environment in the, uh, in, in, in international trade. The Trump administration has, has uh, launched a, a lot of different uh, types of uh, uh, trade agreement and also the, uh, the Biden administration announcing the increase of tariffs. These are the also the risks for us and that is reducing the, the, the trustworthiness of the United States. So that will be uh, very uh, critical. So we need to, I, we need to uh, discuss and uh, you know, uh, to identify what are the strategic items which are excessively depending on a certain country and make sure that we need to have more secure and resilient uh, network of trade, uh, typically I I based on the free trade agreement. And then I think this is where the WTO comes in, but I'll stop here. Thank you, Professor Suzuki. Reminding us the risk of over-dependence in the context of economic security, I think your very practical observation, I think it, it resonates with a lot of us in this, uh, in this session. And also, earlier I mentioned that uh, probably the concrete real climate change we are witnessing today is probably the climate change in the global trading system. And in a way, the global trading system has been being polluted, tainted, and tarnished by all the you know, pollution materials. It could be subsidies, political interventions and all that, but in other words, it's like a free trade has become more political, not any more pure economic you know, issue, subject, but it has become a lot more political issue, and it has become a lot more politicized. I mean, we've never seen this kind of level of like, uh, you know, similarity between Democrats and Republicans. I mean, I cannot just say, you know, who's worse, basically. I mean, Trump started but Biden made it worse in a way, or has been making it worse from pure trade, free trade perspective. So I'm so glad I don't have to talk about that issue because I now have a clock uh, from Cato 
Cato has been very well known for really defending globalization and free trade in the purest form possible. And also, I want to note, Clark, uh, our last kind of uh, trip together was to Switzerland right. under Trump administration when we are carefully exploring the possibility of U.S.-Swiss FTA. Uh, we couldn't make it happen, but uh, let us know from Cato's perspective, sure. how do you defend today's, let's say, the stage of globalization and the, the free trade as we see today? Well, first of all, thank you for, for being here, for inviting me, and I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Um, this is an opportunity to, to plug a book that I have coming out this year called Defending Globalization. Um, so to answer your question exactly, uh, look for that later on this fall. Um, so so I, I guess I, I'll think about this and talk about this in, in two ways. One is I think there's some good news and there's also some bad news. Um, you know, it looked like for a while world trade and goods uh, had plateaued, um, but it did so at historically high levels, um, and some moderation was inevitable. Uh, in the United States, exports and imports uh, of goods on an inflation-adjusted basis set records in 2022. Trade and services and digital trade and cross-border investment continues to grow. Um, last year, though, global trade grew at just 1%. The OECD, IMF, and WTO all report, though, that growth in global trade is expected to pick up sharply in 2024 and 2025 as inflation eases and the U.S. economy helps drive commercial activity. Um, I, think, I think patterns of trade and global supply chains are evolving in light of new economic and geopolitical factors, but those changes seem fairly routine and, and common. Instead of deglobalizing, it seems like many corporations are reglobalizing. Uh, whether that's diversifying sourcing, alternative inventory strategies, so it goes. Um, even though the U.S. isn't pursuing any trade liberalization uh, and, and more kind of further economic integration, a lot of countries around the world are. Uh, South Korea applying to join the TPP is a good sign. At the same time, on, on sort of the negative side of the ledger, um, I think there's, there's some fracturing going on within the trading system, as, as has been discussed, um, as U.S. China competition intensifies. Um, the WTO, for example, uh, reports that trade flows within trading blocks of geopolitically aligned countries has grown about 4% faster than trade between blocks since Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine. Um, I think that protectionism is on the rise in two forms. First of all, uh, is would be industrial policy. I worry about the proliferation of industrial policy mm. around the world. It undermines free trade through domestic production subsidies. The IMF recently reported that more than 2,500 industrial policy actions were taken around the world in, in 2023, and two-thirds of those uh, were considered trade distorting since they discriminated against foreign commercial interests. Um, my concern is, is that this is going to create a mess of trade litigation, and it's a loss of efficiency and, and potential growth. Um, it used to be that these policies were much more prevalent in emerging economies around the world. But last year's surge in industrial policy was driven largely by the United States, China, and, and the EU, for, which account for more than half of all of those 2,500 industrial policies. The second form of, of protectionism is, is more direct, which is import substitution and, and good old-fashioned tariffs. Uh, Donald Trump is... is proposing a 10% across-the-board tariff on all imports and a 60% tariff on imports from China. President Biden, as, as Matt mentioned earlier, is launching more tariffs on Chinese EVs in about five hours. Um, national security continues to uh, subordinate economic concerns, and national security is increasingly used as a pretext for protectionism. The Trump administration's national security tariffs on steel and aluminum being a, a fine example of that. Uh, you know, Canadian rebar is not a national security risk to the United States, and, and steel and aluminum coming from Korea or NATO allies is not a risk to the United States. Uh, the, the Biden administration, as well as the Trump campaign, objecting to Nippon Steel's purchase of U.S. steel on national security grounds, that's completely bogus. The Biden administration's semiconductor export controls, I think there's more of a national security case there, but, uh, you know, again, another example of, of national security subordinating uh, economic considerations. 
Overall, U.S. domestic politics favors protectionism right now. My hope is that the, the fever will break in sort of the short and intermediate term. Um, it, it's, as was mentioned, it's been 12 years since the United States entered into a new FTA with a new trading partner. Our U.S. trade representative, Ms. Tai, has, has said that free trade agreements are tools of the 20th century. That is news to basically every country around the world that continues to pursue these. All of this is to say that the United States will be hurt over the long run with the rise of protectionism. But again, it is my hope that, that we can sort of get past this and the fever will break in sort of the short and, and maybe intermediate term. Thank you, Clark. Uh, very, you know, numbers driven, very factual uh, presentation. We'll come back to you concerning the WTO uh, relevance. I'm going to give some more minute to Professor Job, but before we get into that, you know, that will be an important part of the conversation. But I'd like to invite Matthew and um, uh, Ambassador Kim and Professor Suzuki, because now let's get down to more practical level. We talked about big picture, global trading, environment, climate, the challenges we, are, we have to deal with. But let's come down to more practical level. When we talk about free trade, I mean, it's not just pure export import. We're also talking about investment. Investment going into, for example, United States, investment coming to Korea. So investment is an important angle. What I want to ask is that given, you know, Professor Suzuki, you can comment on it, but if you look at the most recent case, Japanese investment going to the United States, I'm talking about Nippon Steel, huge backfire, <laughs> huge backlash from political class. I mean, that's something that, you know, uh, somehow uh, united Republican and then Democrat all at the same time. Now, when it comes down to U.S.-Korea partnership, Please correct me if I'm wrong. My observation is that our engagement with South Korea, our engagement with the United States, despite the fact that we have the Coros FTA, free trade, bilateral trade agreement, our economic engagement seems to be riding on protectionist ideas. Look at IRA, look at Chipset. That's why big companies from Korea, they were motivated Maybe they're forced to invest in the United States because there are big subsidies, again, political interventions and all that. Do you think this is a good thing for our bilateral relationship? Is it sustainable? Also, perhaps it reflects the adaptability of Korea-U.S. economic partnership. I mean, despite the, all the challenging situation, look at Korean companies. They've been doing very well despite the IRA and CHIFs, very protectionist, very protectionist policies from Washington, very wisely, skillfully, they've been utilizing this uh, situation. Any comments from Mr. Goodman, Ambassador Kim? Um, well, there's a lot there. Um, uh, let me just say something about Nippon Steel, first of all. Um, I mean, I, I think that's sort of purely politics. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's about Pennsylvania and mm -hmm. maybe a couple of other states um, that are up for grabs in the November election. And uh, I, I think that's the, the lens through which the, uh, both presidential candidates have uh, said that they oppose um, this, this deal. Uh, I think the, it's, it's very hard to see the national security um, implications or concerns that have been now put in front of CFIUS, the, the committee in the U.S. government that is going to review this transaction. Um, and, I, and I worry that it's going to, uh, the politics would be one thing, the deal won't, you know, end the world if it doesn't go through, but I, th I worry about the misuse of tools that are designed for a particular purpose, and CFIUS is designed for a particular purpose, which is to um, try and uh, weed out uh, a potential national security risk from from uh, these sorts of transactions, and that's clearly not what's at stake here. So it's it's worrisome about the the, the damaging of the tools. Um, more broadly, I mean, I think I, I think you can be more glass half full about the IRA and the Chips Act. I think it's it's uh, the the administration, the Biden administration, has been pretty clear from the beginning, with good reason, that we need to invest more in our domestic capabilities 
um, in certain areas, and you know, certainly I think chips and, and clean energy would would be ones that we um, I think it's reasonable for an administration to want to have uh, more capabilities in those areas, and it will provide some you know some benefits if we uh, spend all this money and we um, produce a better um, array of say clean energy solutions that are you know more affordable and so forth, and if we give our partners um, opportunities to, to participate, uh, which I think has ultimately, you know, been the case for Korea that it's been encouraged. Maybe it wasn't ideal at the beginning, but, and there was sort of tension in, the, in this, on this issue at the beginning, but I think now uh, Korean companies uh, seem to see the possibilities for taking advantage of government subsidies and producing um, um, in the U.S. and, and um, you know, and, and gaining um, other um, benefits um, uh, from doing this. But, you know, you can certainly debate whether, um, whether the, um, uh, you know, the extent to which governments ought to be uh, pursuing these industrial policies. I think Clark's right that, um, that it's reasonable to ask questions about um, uh, how trade distorting uh, these uh, these policies are, um, and you know how ultimately costly they are, um, and and how effective are we really going to rebuild you know some of these sectors um, or build them from scratch? Um, so I do think um, I do think there's a lot a lot to uh, for the U.S. and Korea to to, to work on um, on on these issues. But in the end, I I think Korean companies have. You know, have been able to find a way to work around the, uh, these these new policies. So I'm going to come back to you, Matthew, not to go after you, but to talk about IRA. You know, from Washington perspective uh, later, that'll be one of the last questions. But Ambassador Kim, once again, I think this functional mm -hmm. relationship, partnership between the United States and Korea has been simply amazing. I mean, again, we do have a very advanced bilateral trade agreement. But nowadays, main driver is very much protectionist uh, scheme, subsidies and all that. And you've been advising large companies in Korea. I mean, their concern or growing anxiety nowadays seems to be, what if IRA taken out by Trump? So kind of new potential hurdles. Uh, what do you see in this very rapidly evolving, again, challenge? Mm -hmm. All right. Um Yes, first mentioning about Corus FTA, uh, it really plays a role as a very solid instrument you know, to promote you know, business and trade between two countries across the Pacific. So whatever new systems you introduce, you mentioned about IRA, maybe something else, but as far as that doesn't go controversial or contradictory against the existing agreements, then that is not within the framework of the you know, chorus FTA, but that's just something else. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, number one, you know, anyway, thanks to that kind of uh, you know agreed uh, rules between our two countries, you know, uh, the trade between you know, Korea and U.S. is uh, getting very strong. Uh, we I may, I may present s certain number, but what is clear is our first destination as an export in country uh, was used to be China. But I it has been changing. It has been changing. Our first destination is to United States now. And, and the percentage of our export to China is now decreasing. Well, that may be a good example, you know. Uh, so, of course, didn't really aim to decrease our export to China, but it is true that it, it really helps us to you know, increase bilateral trade between U.S. and Korea. That's number one. And moving over to investment, yes, it is again, you know, uh, since then, investment to, to, to U.S., I don't have the, the number you know, in, in my head for the time being, but has radically increased, radically increased, maybe thanks to the FTA and thanks to IRA, because there's a certain scheme uh, at the beginning or at the introduction of RIA, there was a certain you know, debate both at home and abroad whether this is really in line with the WTO rules or not. 
But you know, now the WTO you know, doesn't function at all. This is not a real global issue to, uh, to discuss on. But having said that, you know, uh, Korean companies are first very anxious to know more about in detail how RIA will, uh, will be in place you know, and will influence on their own business in the United States. But uh, with the lapse of time, it comes clear that uh, it helps their business. Then the real concern for the time being of Korean companies investing in U.S. is <coughs> how they can get along with all those details and criteria of IRA to assure more subsidies from U.S. government. So this is not a struggle of uh, legality, mm -hmm. but this is a struggle of getting more money from, from Washington. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's my you know, perception about that. Uh, another point in investment, well, the tension between U.S. and China, because this is number one and number two economy of the world, is uh, significant enough you know, to change the tone and trend of global trade. And many people think well, th this is the world where geopolitics prevails. You know, everything moves uh, along the strategies of, you know, <laughs> of geopolitics. So geopolitics means you are my friend or you are my enemy. Who is more closer friends or something like that. So as far as the geopolitics prevails in our thought, in our actions, the activities of the government, then you know, inevitably global market, you know, should uh, go along with uh, sh such kind of uh, geopolitics, the division of uh, countries. Uh, that is uh, very clear now. You know, among friendly countries, there's increase of investment, increase of trade. Why? Well, with uh, some other countries who used to be friendly but not anymore, then there's a certain, you know, very visible decrease of investment and trade. So I may say there's a very evident and clear division of nations, you know, in global I in mm -hmm. the, in the mm -hmm. world. That's very crystal clear. That's why, you know, the terms like willing partners, like-minded and willing partners have become really like a key phrase in many geopolitics and foreign policy writings. So the division of, you know, again, like-minded, willing, that kind of uh, division, I think that's something inevitable in a way. I'm going to go to Professor Ja. But very quickly, Professor Suzuki, in the context of uh, Nippon Steel IRA, we just talked about, do you have any quick comments you want to make? Um, yes. Um, the Nippon Steel uh, investment in uh, U.S. Steel is, I think from my point of view even, is a wrong choice. I think it was a bad timing, although it was, uh, you know, th there was an opportunity, but I think Nippon Steel has to think of the political implications. Mm -hmm. So. I think, uh, as Matt said, uh, this is very political, and uh, we have to be careful. But what I want to mention is that the United States, the CFIUS process, goes to the allies and the willing partners or like-minded. You know, it takes about uh, six months mm -hmm. in average to get through the uh, CFIUS process to, to invest in the United States. By the way, Japan is the number one investor in the United States. But if we are making this, you know, the geopolitical framework into this, uh, you know, trade system or investment system, I think there should be a different treatment for the allies and partners for the, you know, in the CFIUS process. I think it is, I, I, I heard of many cases that the Japanese investment has lost the chances because of this process took so long. So I think, I mean, Nippon Steel case is that, you know, they, they, they haven't really have an experience of investing in the United States. Therefore, I think they, they, this is an ignorant, ignorant mistake. But basically, I think this uh, whole process is not really designed for the you know, benefit of the friends and allies. Indeed, that's why once again I brought up this whole analogy. Global trading environment has been polluted, uh, polluted and politicized, I mean, especially given this election year. So I don't think it's going to get any better anytime soon. But Professor Ja, I really appreciate your very direct, candid engagement with us. So I'm going to invite you. I, I want you to let us know how you really see this whole new chapter between U.S. and China and China and U.S. Obviously, in my personal perspective, when President Trump was thinking about 
U.S. economic relationship with China, I think he was probably one word. It's unfair. You know, he was talking about deficits and all that. And bottom line of the relationship, he would like to fix. I mean, I don't think he's going after the collapse of the Chinese economy. I think he just think that the trade practices that China, Beijing, uh, you know, China has been implementing just simply unfair and and uh, not a responsible way, kind of uh, you know, stakeholder uh, as a part of the member of the WTO. So, what could you tell us from your perspective? What could you let us know? What's up, basically, from Beijing's perspective? I'm going to make a long lecture short. <laughs> <laughs> that unfairness did not begin with Trump. Uh, Bush Jr., uh, when President Bush Jr. was in office, there was a collective study uh, by two governments to track down what was really going on with the trade numbers. Um, in other words, Trump, we should not make think about Trump as being exceptional. The U.S. complained about trade with China being unfair dated back before President Clinton, you know, changed most of my favorite nation arrangement to TNTR, home permanent normal trade relationship. Point two is that why the U.S. sentiment in the U.S. is so grippingly strong for so many decades. One direct contributing factor is that U.S. direct investment into China never, ever went beyond more than 2% of total U.S. outflow. Worse than that, I wouldn't say worse, more to that is that those investment deals were usually outsourced to Southeast Asian Chinese or Chinese like me to manage. So you have a total divorce of facts. The headquarters of these large U.S. companies in Beijing did not really know what was going on in China. This is so different. It's a, a very basic fact. You look at the Korean investments, Japanese investments, their <coughs> operations in China, they usually have whole management teams sent from home. But for those U.S. investments in China, there was a very thin home level, and of course, the America thrives on you know, the can-do spirit, and the contract arrangement. And Chinese investment in the U.S. never ever went beyond the 0.6% of total inflow of U.S. In foreign investment into U.S. And off some of the Chinese investments they mostly went into real estate, hotels, or you know, renting places for new Chinese migrants. So it, we need to get beyond the China, U.S., Trump, Xi, or whoever else. Structurally, U.S.-China economic relationship is structurally weak, and it has always been a wave at each other at the port <laughs> type of relationship. And now moving into the future, a lot how this will change will actually de depend on self-reflection, the domestic conversation. I'm not saying bilateral conversations or these kind of um, conversations are not useful. Over there in China, we must profoundly ask ourselves, do you actually progress? Rather than just those total numbers, with a thinner U.S technology or business presence in your country. And over there in the U.S., hopefully there was also some asking, are the Chinese indeed that, you know, evil? Are you the U.S. In better off with, say, with an ever thinner Chinese involvement? I think that's probably what I would... Uh, that's uh, what I would say. Thank you for that. It's a, there's <coughs> there, it, it would be very wrong, again, let me repeat, it would be very wrong to attribute 
the current day sentiments to one individual, Mr. Trump? Of course, you know, but uh, obviously that was a very visible trigger, and that's why I use that line. But I appreciate your comment. But here, I want to invite Clark because, from you know, your perspective, obviously, when it comes down to pure free trade, you know, we have this thinking that as long as we continue our trading relations with China, for example, China will open up. China will continue its you know, liberalization process and all that. Therefore, uh, we should keep doing what we've been doing. And that's a kind of, if I may, sum up the, uh, the bottom line position of, like, uh, let's say, Cato's perspective on free trade. How would you make a counter argument, let's say, to Professor Jazz or my quick summary on that, you know, uh, observation? I mean, are we really seeing that? Do you really see that? Can we still apply this 100% pure form of free, free trade to real practice of global trading? Yeah, that, that's an interesting question. I put out a paper last year called Course Correction that, that I think lays out where I think um, the relationship, uh, the U.S. policy response to the current economic relationship has, has gone astray. Um, I do give the Trump administration credit for correctly diagnosing a lot of the problems that, in my perspective, uh, problems emanating out of Beijing, whether that's the abuse of intellectual property or forced technology transfer, whatever, the, you know, the, the, the list goes on. Um, I, I, have an, uh, I have a very serious problem with the way the tariffs were implemented. Um, I think that, you know, in hindsight, the United States should have pursued more aggressive dispute settlement at the WTO. I think we should have sanctioned individual companies and actors as opposed to, you know, blunt force tariffs. Oh. Um, you know, the New York Fed estimates that the average American family uh, about $1,000 a year in, in increased costs uh, as a result of the trade war, and, and that's going to continue with, with the Biden administration's, um, you know, announced tariffs. Um, but again, I, I, I do hope that, there, that there's an exit ramp uh, or some sort of off-ramp for, for the tensions that exist between the United States and China. Um, the EU put out a study at the end of 2022 that basically said 94% of all of our trade between EU member nations and, and China is not problematic in the sense that it does not implicate in any way national security, but also does not result in any one-sided dependency. A similar analysis has not been done in the United States, but I would assume that it would be fairly high, that, that, that there simply, are, I mean, there, to be clear, there are certain products that I think should probably not be traded between the United States and China. Um, but, but I do think that, that we need to be honest about this, that a lot of the products, in fact, I would imagine the overwhelming majority of products that the United States and China trade do not implicate national security and do not, would not result in one-sided dependencies. So I think if we can tone down the rhetoric in, in those areas, I think it allows uh, maybe more constructive dialogue on, you know, more challenging issues. Because this, to me, seems like it ca can be again, an off-ramp or an exit uh, from the current tensions and, and allows, again, more focus on, on other areas because it seems like we get distracted. You know, Trump being just so focused on the bilateral trade deficit is, is totally immaterial and we spent a lot of time in, in that negotiation that led up to the phase one deal hectoring the Chinese to purchase more soybeans that they were already purchasing before uh, the tariffs were put in place in, in sort of a Sisyphean attempt to, to close the bilateral trade deficit. The United States needed to be spending its, its capital, political capital created by the leverage or, or leverage from, from the tariffs, um, kind of attacking more of, of the holistic problems that, that we have that are fu more fundamental than, than a bilateral trade deficit. I think the bottom line kind of key two key words would be transparency and accountability. I think that's the essence of this ongoing tension or, you know, <coughs> um, the source of, you know, basically the tension. Um, we're going to come back to WTO issue in that context, but Ambassador Kim, you want to make a quick comment? Yes, yes. Well, just, just to pick up, you know, what uh, Mr. Packard has mentioned, and I really try, uh, would like to respect, you know, your your view to construct a positive dialogue you know, between US and China. 
but personally, you know, I, I, I'm quite pessimistic uh, on the future, you know, relations between U.S. and China, because the tension is not only on who takes more or larger market share, or who lead, uh, who take the leadership in a certain, you know, future industry. I, I, I think that the reason of the tension is much more undercurrent and fundamental. No? Well, this is uh, a, what can I, uh, how can I say, uh, perspectives, you know, different perspectives of uh, liberal democracy versus communist authoritarianism, one say, the other party, and market economy versus state planning economy, and respect of individual you know, human right versus totalitarianism. It's kind of one. So there's a deep and deep difference of views you know, from each other. As far as this kind of difference consists, you know, I, th I think the future relationship between China and U.S. Can, cannot be easily remedied. You know, that's, uh, that's, my, that's my personal view. No, I mean, I that's well said. Right. That's why I emphasize the transparency and accountability, mutual one. Uh -huh. But Matthew, do we yeah, add I'm just going to pick up on now Dr. Ja and um, uh, Minister Kim have both um, pointed out the sort of deeper structural challenges in the U.S. China. And I do think, you know, I do think that's right. And I think, honestly, from an, a Washington perspective, um, that big, the biggest problem or underlying uh, structural issue is that China has chosen to move away from the previous policy of reform and opening, um, which um, not only I think was um, a, 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 a sort of a policy with which we were more comfortable, but I think it was better for China, but that's not my yes. department. <laughs> that's up to Dr. Cha <laughs> and others to comment on. But, um, you know, but that was a decision taken before Xi Jinping. I mean, and then again, these things predate uh, the, the, the people that are often identified with them. Um, you know, going back to the Hu Jintao administration, and uh, and I think that um, that has changed the calculation here in or in Washington about how to respond to these issues because um, I think there is a view that China is committed to a course of um, whatever the opposite of reform and opening is, um, and is determined, you know, through indigenous innovation, through you know. Um, uh, you know, massive uh, industrial subsidies and so forth to gain the commanding heights of many key sectors. And I don't think anybody's said the word overcapacity yet, but the current <coughs> know, um, <coughs> concern is about, and the reason the Biden administration is going to, or the stated reason that they're going to announce these, uh, these tariff increases tomorrow is that, uh, is they're very concerned about the implications of China's policies in this regard um, leading to overcapacity in a range of uh, critical uh, sectors as seen from Washington. And, um, uh, you know, I think that, I think that, that that trend line is, is really the underlying problem in our relationship that uh, we are now responding to more or less appropriately. And, you know, there's a lot to argue with and the approach that's being taken, but, but it's a response really to a set of decisions in China about their development path, I think. And that's, um, you know, that's, a, that's a, um, an uncomfortable um, perspective to be uh, making perhaps in this audience, but I, I think that that's, that's really the underlying truth in the problem. Again, well said, Mr. Goodman. It's uncomfortable, but it is something must be said. So I want to invite Mr. Professor Suzuki. Right. Um, I, I, I fully understand the U.S. position and uh, what Matthew says, but at the same time, I think the United States, since the end of World War II, has been the champion of the free trade and has established the uh, you know, the system of free trade and during 1980s that the United States imposed Japan to be, you know, to be less industrial policy and uh, less <laughs> uh, tariffs and, you know, try to open the market because Japan was an unfair. So it seems that there is a sort of a repetition of the similar languages that is happening. And I think this time the United States is taking the sort of a, a very different measures uh, 
to you know uh, to be considered as a uh, a protectionist measure, and it's un uncomfortable because it is against what the United States has promoted for in the last 70 some years. And I, th I, I think that is, the, that is the source of the problem I, uh, in, in our view. And I think it is true that the, the Chinese practices of the free trade is not exactly as you know, the, the, the institution was designed to be, but I think um, we need to, uh, I, I think at, at the end of the day, we don't have any particular tools to to correct the these uh, you know the um, sort of a malaligned behavior of to to the um, to the free trade. So I think we need to maintain certain you know the the teeth of the institutions of the WTO. But again, the United States has not really in you know encouraging to to use the WTO dispute settlement mechanism. So I think these are the combination of this uh, anxiety for us that whether we can maintain the, the rule-based international order. And I think that both China and the United States seems to you know, go head to head to, you know, uh, to, to derail uh, uh, from the, uh, the rule-based international order. And that is actually the source of this uh, uncomfortableness. Professor Jai, if I give you one minute, would you like to make any additional comments? I mean, we've been talking about very important subject, obviously, right? Well, you, at the beginning, you said 75 minutes, which Not is enough. of all the <laughs> issues. Um, I would invite you to look at some studies that tracked uh, comparatively Chinese and American responses to WTO rulings, especially over those cases when the WTO athlete body ruled, you know, the defendant uh, as having violated the rules. And after that ruling, what was done uh, respectively in China and in the US. Uh, um, so that's one quick response. Of course, uh, to be honest, I think since 2017, the Chinese response to WTO rulings that were negative has been less uh, forthcoming. We debate among ourselves. Prior to that, the Chinese had a much better record. I mean, uh, literally went back to correct a lot of policies. Since 2017, there's a walk back. It's not uh, in our interest, as, me, as I see as a scholar. But as for, far as uh, um, a uh, U.S.-China relationship is concerned, unless, unless you really prepare for a total war. I'm not talking about the rocks in the South China Sea. I'm not talking about Taiwan. I'm talking about, you know, each other. We, the painful but the necessary rethinking is to ask ourselves, are we really heading in the correct direction of, you know, not of restricting investment going into each other's directions. And uh, they, this is a, a fundamental question. It's a question for us over there in China. It's also a question I would think that benefit the United States uh, down the road. The, when you start to paint the color of investment with the ideology, you know, this is red money, that's Chinese money, uh, that's democratic money, and you disregard the benefit of cross-border investment. I'm not saying it's free, 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 free. Every country has its gates, but like every household. You have a gate, you have a screen, right? That's un very well understood. But at this point of time, a lot of the groups, there is a too much group think that's really going in a self-destructive position for, for both societies. Thank you. So we have about three minutes. Just quickly, you know, some people say or ask, when Trump comes back, he may withdraw the United States from the membership of WTO. Wonderful. I think that's really overblown worry. I don't think that can happen. So we're just saying, Matthew, would you agree with me or would you disagree, Clark? <laughs> I, uh, boy, I, I don't know. I, I think it's... <laughs> 
uh, always difficult to predict the future, but especially when it comes to Mr. Trump, it's very hard to make predictions about what he's going to do in any particular area, except I think you can confidently say that trade is the one issue, I think, on which he has a very clear view, whether you agree with or disagree right. with the view, he has a view, and you can expect him to try to act on that view, um, and he's going to, by the way, look very carefully at the large, I, I'm guessing, the large um, trade deficit that we have with the Republic of Korea, and he's going to, you know, I'm guessing, not be happy with that, and he, you know, is going to um, look for remedies to that, which could range along a spectrum of, of possibilities. Um, I think the WTO, it's possible. I mean, it's something that he feels very strongly about. I'm, I, all the other policy issues that you could discuss with respect to Mr. Trump, I'm not certain about, but on trade, I'm pretty confident he's going to act on, or try to act on the things that he's said he's going to do. So um, I think we all need to, if, if that's the outcome, and I'm not predicting that's the outcome of our election, but I'm just saying to the premise of your question, um, I, I do think we should expect him to do things like that, and it's possible. I think your last comments really opens up our future conversations. So this will continue, and let's see what happens in November 5. But if I may, just a last comment. Along with the Mr. Trump, if he wins, I think he'll bring along this one individual 100% for sure. His name is Robert Lighthizer. He's not going to be again USTR, mm -hmm. but he will take a new position in the Trump administration part two. So let's see what happens. And that makes our uh, next year's Assam plenum perhaps <laughs> more exciting. Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention and applaud to our panelists. If you